So it's official, we are currently empty nesters. I'm wearing pants right now, but it's been strictly optional this past week. Meanwhile, our daughters settled nicely into university, and we got off pretty lucky. We did it all with a minimal amount of tears or fuss, which is great considering she's moved to a campus that is hours and hours away from us. And while most kids are moving in with the rest of the freshman rabble in this flurry of emotional frenzy, where the parents line up behind other parents in front of the residence when suddenly student volunteers descend on the car like a pack of locusts, grabbing your child's possessions as well as your child and whisking them off to their residence. And I get it, it prevents long, awkward goodbyes, but it can leave the parents feeling somewhat stunned and bereft. We're lucky, our daughter's in the STEM field, which meant she was at the university a whole week earlier. We got keys to her residence and we had the building to ourselves, we parked the van in front of it, and while she was off at orientation, we unpacked the van for her. And it's a good thing too. I mean, wandering around the campus, we saw a lot of university freshmen coming in, carrying like two to three large suitcases. Meanwhile, our daughter had packed our minivan to the gills, including a roof rack. I think secretly her plan is to not do laundry until she returns to us for the Thanksgiving break. I mean, I don't even think student volunteers could have successfully unpacked our van. There is a lot of stuff, and even halfway through the unpacking process, we left to go to Ikea and get a bookshelf and a shoe rack. I mean, her room is packed, but super, super cozy. This is completely new territory for us. Neither my wife or I have ever lived on a residence campus before in our life, so we've been pulling friends and family to find out more for ourselves and our daughter. We learned about floor cest and how it's never a good idea to have relations with anyone on your floor because it leads to inevitable awkwardness later on. We also learned that the washrooms on each resident co-ed floor switch from guys to girls from year to year, which goes a long way explaining why the guy's washroom on our daughter's floor only has two stalls and no urinals, which frankly seems like a disaster. What incoming freshman boy is gonna be fastidious about lifting the seat? It is pee everywhere. I don't know what I would do. I guess that just means I'd be shitting in the shower and waffle stomping it through the drain. It's a disaster. And on the girl's side, well, it clearly used to be a guy's washroom where some thuggish freshman has decided to tackle the stalls because they're completely unmoored. Neither the doors closed, let alone locked. So, I mean, this university needs to figure that out. Meanwhile, we as parents are reading think pieces about the new scourge of college campuses, depression, and how the advent of mobile phones has led to a delaying in sexual gratification, experimentation with drugs and alcohol, and the need to drive, but has also led to a precipitous incline in depression and suicide. It's actually a really interesting article. I'll have a link to it below. But, you know, our kid's smart, but we can't help but worry. We're parents, and it's weird to be on this side of the equation. When I was growing up, I was such a shit that actively tried to cut my parents out of my life. Not from a lack of love, but for a need to be independent. I mean, after first year university, I took off and lived in Korea for a year. After second year, I got in a car, went off to BC with no work prospects or a place to stay even lined up, figuring we'd work it out once we got there. Even in high school, high school, I remember a last minute trip where we just jumped in a car and went to Florida for March break unsupervised. I remember the subsequent year in high school organizing a trip for other high school students. I got a free trip for every 20 kids I got. I got 40 kids. I sold those two free trips myself. And then the day of departure, I handed the list off to a friend, said good luck, sent all these unsupervised high school kids off to Florida for our March break, took that money, and went skiing in Vermont. I mean, I would lose my shit if my daughter did something like that but I have to understand that she is working to slowly adult on her own as well. It feels a bit like that moment when you're writing an exam and the teacher at the front of the class says, pencil down. All your studying, all your attending classes, your note taking, your coursework, your group work, it's gonna have to be enough. And it's the same with her daughter. We hope we've instilled in her enough confidence and skill to tackle this next phase in her life, but it's pencils down. I mean. You can feel confident that you did okay, but you're not really gonna know until that exam or that child comes back to you. So, Booktube, before I talk about what I read this week, what advice do you have for college freshmen? What was your experience like? What are those unsaid rules you wish you'd known going in? I'd love to know in the comments below. The Devotion of Suspect X by Kiego Higashino is one of those books that languished on my super secret TBR pile for like six months before I kicked it off to the curb. 
and it only recently popped back up when it was mentioned as Books and Boba's August Read. Now, Books and Boba is a podcast devoted to Asian writers. And it's one of those podcasts that I just started listening to, as if I don't have enough podcasts to listen to already. Now, it turns out that Kiego Higashino's book was kind of a big deal. Published in 2005, it won the Naoki Prize, the Honkaku Mystery Award, and the English translation was even up for an Edgar. It sold well over 2 million copies in Japan, which sounds like a big deal, and it is a big number, but to put that into context, Harry Potter and the Cursed Child sold that amount in just two days. But the book has also spawned three movie adaptations, one in Korean, one in Japanese, and one in Chinese. It's spawned an ongoing Japanese TV show, and it's currently being optioned for an English language remake. So as far as Japanese exports go, only Hello Kitty, Sailor Moon, and Tentacle Porn have more traction. Yasuko Hanawaka is a divorced, middle-aged woman who works at the local bento box lunch counter. When her abusive ex-husband Togashi shows up looking for a handout, one thing leads to another, and suddenly Yasuko and her teenage daughter Masato suddenly find themselves looking at the dead, lifeless, and limp body of Togashi on their apartment floor. And now, no spoilers, all this happens in the first few pages. This isn't a whodunit, this is more of a how-to-get-away-with-murder scenario got a body, how do you cover up the crime? So enter Ishigami. He's the heavyset, round-faced high school math teacher who also happens to be Yasuko's neighbor. He overhears the commotion and manages to deduce exactly what has happened, and he offers up his services. Trust me, he says, logical thinking will get us through this. I mean, who hasn't wondered how you dispose of a body and get away with it? It's not enough to douse it in acid and flush it down the drain, which isn't what happens here. You have that added complication of ensuring that the murderers aren't always looking over their shoulder waiting for the other shoe to drop. You have to cover up the crime, and then you have to ensure that Yasuko and her daughter are completely in the clear and ruled out as suspects. And that's the problem that Ishigami is faced with. And that's the fun of the book. On one hand, you're working alongside Ishigami to figure out how he can get away with it, how he constructs the perfect alibi. But at the same time, you're working alongside the police as they try to chip away to the truth. What mistakes has Ishigami made that might ultimately reveal what happened to poor Tagashi? Along with the police, you are working alongside physics professor Manabu Yukawa. He's also colloquially known as Inspector Galileo. Coincidentally, he went to school with Ishigami and highly regarded him as a math genius and is therefore surprised to see him at a dead-end job teaching high school math to a bunch of sullen teenagers. Um, so it's the physicist versus the mathematician mentally squaring off against each other. At one point, Yukawa asks Ishigami, which is more difficult, to create the insolvable problem or to solve that problem? And that is the crux of the story. Does Ishigami create the perfect alibi or does Yukawa uncover the truth that lies underneath? The story moves along nicely, the translation is cleanly done, doesn't draw attention to itself, and there's enough clues sprinkled throughout that you could formulate a theory about what's been done, but there's twists and turns aplenty. So I'm grateful to Books and Boba to turn me back onto this book. So that's it for this week. Your university experiences in the comments below, rules, advice, anything that you could give to our daughter, fantastic. Appreciate it. In the meantime, I hope you have a great week of reading. We'll talk to you soon.